Welcome to the Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield and Count the Kicks Millennial Health Pregnancy Webinar. Let us know where you're from. Continue to do so by, by placing your city and state in the chat function. In about 45 minutes, we are going to open it up to an interactive Q&A session and we want you to take part. Please place any questions throughout this webinar that you might have for our panelists in the Q&A function um, throughout the session at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi there, I'm Emily Price, Executive Director of Healthy Birthday Inc. Thank you for joining us for this important webinar on millennial pregnancy health. Um, we are deeply grateful to our sponsor, Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, for providing the funding, the data, and the insights to make this hour possible. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. First is Dr. Tim Gutshaw, the Chief Medical Officer of Wellmark Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Dr. Gutshaw? Hi, Emily. Thank you again for um, hosting this, and we appreciate everybody who's uh, tuning into this webinar. It's going to be very valuable, so thank you and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gutshaw. I would like to also introduce you to Mark Toludo, the Vice President, Strategy and Analytics for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. It's the organization that dove deep into the data that we're going to be discussing today. Hi, Mark. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're also really excited to introduce to you Vuan Foster. She's the Count the Kicks Ambassador in the state of New Jersey, who is currently expecting a baby. Ms. Foster is also a millennial maternal health professional whose life's work is centered on improving birth outcomes. Hi, Vuan. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I look forward to talking with you about what it's like to navigate the prenatal space during a pandemic. And we'll give you key takeaways and tips for moms to navigate pregnancy right now. Thank you, Vuan, and thank you to our awesome panelists. Um, as I mentioned, 4 million women give birth in the U.S. every single year. 85% of those are two millennial women. A majority of these women have healthy pregnancies and healthy deliveries. However, an analysis of Blue Cross Blue Shield data reveals an increasing number of millennial women are experiencing pregnancy complications and childbirth complications. The number of women experiencing both pregnancy complications and childbirth complications um, increased 31.5% in just five years. Mark Toludo, as we introduced to you earlier from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, is here to shine more light on what the data is showing us. So Mark, tell us a little bit more about the data that you're seeing. Great. Um, thank you very much. I'm, again, I'm delighted to be here. As it was, was mentioned, we did a uh, we looked at um, an in-depth, we did an in-depth analysis of looking at what was happening, obviously, uh, you know, with uh, childbirth, pregnancy complications and childbirth complications. But we also um, looked at extensively uh, millennial health. And I want to start off my conversation, if you could go to uh, this first slide here. Um, um, I wanted to start off my conversation with it, just an update on what, we, what we're finding in our data. As, it, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we insure one in three Americans. Um, we are, we like to say we are in every zip code across the country and we have a wealth of data to really understand what's happening locally in every community across the country and then bring that data up to a national perspective. Um, so um, the millennial health, the, the findings on our pregnancy um, um, insights were really powered by um, our Blue Cross and Blue Shield Health Index, which, I'm, uh, which this slide showcases. It allows us to examine not only the health of communities across America, but take a closer look at the health of unique populations uh, like millennials and expectant mothers. Um, it, it, um, if we focus on claims data, a little bit of, in terms of the methodology, we focus on claims data and other healthcare data as opposed to aggregated uh, government statistics. So it's actually based on the experience that our members are having um, that our, our members and are having, um, those carrying around a Blue Cross and Blue Shield card are having in their communities. Um, it's built from actual healthcare experiences, medical claims of more than, of our commercially insured population, one in three. It includes more than 300 health conditions and reports on population by, by, by age, by sex, by geography, and by gender. Um, so it gives you a little bit of why we're able to go deeper and really understand the unique needs and health conditions of specific populations. So if you turn to the next slide, um, I could talk a little bit about uh, millennials. Um, we noticed overall 
why we focus on millennials, just, just as an FYI, we, we've noticed that, um, you know, the prevalence of some of their chronic conditions of this age cohort, we're mirroring um, the prevalence of, con you know, of the prevalence rates of, of older generations in terms of, of what they're facing in terms of diabetes and heart failure. And more importantly, not only was the prevalence getting closer to what those older generations were experiencing, but the rate of growth in terms of what we're seeing in prevalence rates was also alarming as well. So millennials obviously account for the majority of expecting mothers today and are defined as individuals age 25 to 40 in 2021. Uh, using the Health Index in 2019, we published two reports that highlighted that one, millennials are less healthy than in previous generations when they were the same age. And two, uh, we also looked at with our partner Moody's Analytics, we looked at the potential economic and financial impacts of, of poor millennial health on productivity, um, uh, on productivity uh, and its impact to the economy. Um, more importantly, specific to today, is that poor millennial health is leading women to be sicker when entering into pregnancy, which is ultimately driving worse health outcomes in terms of maternal health, both in pregnancy complications as well as childbirth complications, which you'll see in a second. Um, the tr the, but before I get there, the trends in overall millennial health were alarming. Uh, what, we what we revealed is that um, health begins to decline at the age of 27. Um, you know, so um, what we're seeing is um, there's a number of chronic conditions that begin to appear um, uh, at the age of around mid-20s uh, that, that begin to show themselves. And specifically, when we looked at the millennial age cohort, uh, we found the following. Uh, we identified the top 10 conditions impacting um, uh, millennial health. Eight out of those 10 conditions impacting millennial health saw double-digit increases in the time period that we studied. Uh, we looked at a, a four-year time horizon. Um, just to give you an example, there was a 31% increase in, in, um, in uh, the prevalence rate of major depression, a 10% increase in substance use disorder, a 16% increase in the prevalence rate of hypertension, 29% in hyperactivity, 10% um, in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, 12% increase in high cholesterol, and a 22% increase in diabetes. Six out of the 10, six out of the 10 um, conditions in the top 10 are behavioral health conditions, major depression, substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder, hyperactivity, a set of psychotic conditions, and tobacco use disorder. Um, compared to men, adverse health is 20% um, larger or greater or worse, depending on uh, how you frame it, for women and largely driven by major depression, type 2 diabetes, and a set of endocrine conditions. Um, and then finally, millennials, uh, what, we, what we notice and we looked at different age cohorts is millennials also have greater adverse health compared to um, uh, the previous generation, the generation Xers, when they were the same age, uh, about 11% greater adverse health. And that adverse health is primarily being driven by an increase in cardiovascular conditions and an increase in endocrine conditions. So um, just present a picture of what's happening with millennial health because that needs to be put in context of how we look at, obviously, uh, maternal health as well. Next slide. Um, I call this slide, you know, sort of a, a very interesting uh, retrospect and look at what's happening with millennials as well as what ha what's happening to that previous generation. We completed an age cohort analysis leveraging the health index data from 2014 to 20, uh, roughly around 2017. Um, we're refreshing this data as we speak. Um, this allows us to bring the youngest generation Xers that were aged 37 and 39 in 2017 back in time to 2014 when they were 34 to 36. This matches the oldest millennials who are also 34 to 36 years old in 2017. So if you look at this, um, one column looks at millennials in 2017. One column looks at generation Xers in 2014 when they were of millennial age. It's the best way to describe it. And you could see that out of these conditions, these top 10 conditions, eight of the 10 conditions, we saw um, increases in um, prevalence rates, higher increases in prevalence rates of millennials versus their generation X uh, counterparts. Um, 
Millennials have higher prevalence rates for eight out of the 10 conditions, as I mentioned, major depression, substance use disorder, hypertension, hyperactivity, Crohn's disease, colitis, high cholesterol, tobacco, um, use disorder, and type 2 diabetes com compared to their uh, previous generation, Generation X uh, counterpart. Um, you know, clearly, there's, you know, when we did a listening session, we went all throughout the country, there's, there could be a diagnosis effect going on here. So re recognizing that we're better at diagnosing certain conditions than we were in the past, and we, 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 we obviously are, and there's, um, we're breaking down barriers in terms of depression and stigma. However, there is something that unique that is happening with this population in terms of um, uh, their lifestyle, uh, the stress is placed on this generation, um, and and environmental factors, which really are driving some substantial, we believe some substantial differences in, in a poor millennial health compared to their counterparts. And, and we, we thoroughly explored this with, um, as part of our listening session in 2019, couldn't do it in 2020, obviously because of COVID, but 2019, when we reached out to um, um, a medical experts, we reached out to employers and actually millennials to get a better understanding of what are the unique um, aspects of their life which are contributing to, um, to adverse health. Um, if you look at the next slide, um, um, and here we focus in on uh, uh, pregnancy, higher chronic physical and behavioral health condition rates for millennials align with a rise in pre-existing conditions and expecting mothers. In our analysis, if the, what this slide reveals is that we saw double digit increases in all the conditions examined between 2014 and 2018 for women prior to pregnancy. Uh, we looked at hypertension, diabetes, diagnosed obesity, behavioral health conditions such as substance use disorder and major depression. And this trend mirrors what we saw more broadly when we, uh, more broadly what you saw earlier in terms of, of, of the health conditions that overall millennials are, are experiencing. We also fielded a survey, a, uh, a survey with millennials to understand how many women were getting the recommended prenatal and postnatal care as prescribed. Though that through the survey, we learned that around 14% of women were not getting prenatal care until their second trimester. And as you know, early prenatal care is important to reduce the chances of potential pregnancy and or childbirth complications. As risk of these complications rise with preexisting conditions, um, Early prenatal care is particularly important for women with one or, mul one or multiple pre-existing conditions. The next slide, please. In line with increasing rates of pre-existing conditions and expecting mothers, pregnancy and childbirth complications, I think that was mentioned earlier in my, before um, I spoke, um, uh, pre um, uh, pregnancy and childbirth complications are seeing double digit increases as you can see here. Um, it's important to note the 16% um, in terms of pregnancy complications as well as childbirth complications at 14.2%. It's important to note here that while, you know, a majority, of the, a majority of pregnancies have a smooth delivery with healthy babies, however, we are seeing an alarm, a rising increase in, in obviously these complications. The highest rates of complications we're seeing in older women, not surprisingly, age 33 to 44, Older women experience significantly higher pregnancy complications. However, when we look at childbirth complications, that's the uh, number to the bottom right, um, uh, pregnant, um, childbirth complications are roughly in line with the other age cohorts. Next slide. Complications, um, this looks at uh, uh, rates of both gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. As you can see, they both increase by double digits as well as most childbirth complications. Complications driving the overall double digit increase that we saw on the previous slide include, as, as I mentioned, gestational diabetes. We're seeing significant increases there, pre and preeclampsia for pregnancy complications. And when we look at, um, and, or for childbirth complications, excuse me, when we look at pregnancy complications, it's eclampsia, cardiomyopathy, embolism, sepsis, and respiratory distress for childbirth complications. Um, so there's a number of, of conditions, both, both in pregnancy and childbirth complications, which are driving those significant increases that we saw over our, over our study period. Next slide, please. Um, did you go too far? 
Additionally, women have, um, uh, yes, that's the slide I want. Thank you. Additionally, women who have pregnancy complications are twice as likely to have complications during delivery. Uh, this is what this slide shows. In particular, women with pregnancy complications were 16 times likelier to experience eclampsia. Most other childbirth complications were closer to about one to two times more likely if the mother had pregnancy complications coming into, um, uh, if, the, if the mother had pregnancy complications. So clearly, um, um, you know, this is an area that, um, you know, we showed significant increase in terms of what we're seeing in the data. And then I think uh, my second to last slide is, please go to the next slide, it looks at postpartum depression. Um, as you can see here, postpartum depression increased by almost 30% and is lower among older women. Oh, so when considering female health after childbirth, postpartum depression is an important topic um, that has received a, you know, a lot of attention um, in recent years. In our study, we saw an increase in PPD, PPD diagnosis of almost 30%, 28.5 here over five years. And diagnosis rates were highest amongst the youngest age group, those at, at around 18 to 24 years of age. As you are likely aware, screening for PPD and as, um, at postnatal visits is critical in identifying postpartum depression, um, especially early on. However, our survey showed that a, only about a quarter of women reported not getting screening or not knowing if they were screened. So clearly we have, area, we have um, significant areas to improve upon. And then finally, um, the last slide looks at anxiety. As you know, anxiety is one of those major areas impacting overall millennial health. Uh, Pre-existing behavioral health conditions are, are linked with a greater risk for, pro, for, uh, for postpartum depression, as we, as we stated earlier. In our analysis, we saw that anxiety was the primary pre-existing condition leading to PPD, with 64% of women diagnosed with PP, uh, postpartum depression having anxiety as a pre-existing condition. So uh, with that, I know I peppered you with a lot of slides um, and a lot of da data and facts. And um, I, I thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to really go deep in what we're, what we're seeing in our commercially insured population with our members um, with regards to maternal health. I'm not gonna hand it over to Emily. Um, Emily, the, the floor is yours, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that really valuable information. At this point, we'd also like to bring in Dr. Tim Gutshaw, the Chief Medical Officer of um, Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. So why do you think we are seeing such dramatic increases in these poor health conditions? Well, Emily, I think it's important to sort of understand how do you bucket uh, what are the potential predeterminants of, uh, of health outcomes. The way I like to sort of put those together is I think of genetic issues, I think of lifestyle issues, I think of environmental issues, access to healthcare and nutrition. Those are sort of the five big buckets that you can look at because there's not a singular answer uh, to this problem. Uh, depending on communities, depending on um, age of women, other kinds of things, any one of those factors could be right, and any one or a number of those factors could potentially impact um, uh, to be able to go ahead and just uh, explain uh, potentially poor health outcomes. Just as an example, when we talk about lifestyle, I mean, that talks about activity. It talks about what generations ago used to do uh, for work as far as their physical, um, uh, 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 the physical need, so to speak, to accomplish work compared to what we do now. It has to do with even some of our built environments. It's, um, how, how we have access to be able to go ahead and to uh, uh, experience um, uh, you know, activity in community as part of the, our underlying kind of way that we go about life. So all of those things are going to be part and parcel of how we try to explain some of the differences in the health outcomes of women uh, now compared to previously. I appreciate that. You know, this data was all collected before the COVID-19 pandemic um, came to the U.S. And so, you know, I'm really curious, the COVID pandemic has created such challenges for women across mm -hmm. Continuum of maternal health care. So take a look at some of these um, statistics from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association here um, that are coming up in just a second. If we could go to the next slide. There we go. So prenatal, um, th this is some of the impact that we're seeing, and this is really up-to-date information from the Blue Cross yes. Blue Association. Go ahead, Mark. Tell us a little bit more about um, what, you're, what you have on the screen there. 
Well, this was a survey, and we do pulse surveys throughout the year. Um, you know, we, we're actually looking at, right now, we're looking at the impact of, um, of deferred care and, and who is deferred care and what are they deferring. But we did, uh, we did this survey in April of 2020, looking at the impact of, of COVID, um, creating, um, you know, in terms of women getting prenatal care, how it's impacted their delivery experience and postnatal care. And some of these, obviously, um, you know, we don't have a, we, uh, you know, uh, you know, clearly it is having an impact in terms of missed uh, visits, uh, missed appointments, um, looking at how it's impacted uh, maternal delivery, um, delivering at a different hospital, shifted to a home birth or use a different doctor for a delivery. And uh, obviously what it's, what it's doing in terms of the pandemic to, uh, uh, to ensure that women are getting the appropriate postnatal care that they need. So, um, you know, while we did this survey um, early on in the pandemic, we do have a pulse survey in, in field right now that's looking at, um, that will look at how this uh, evolves over time. Um, clearly, the pandemic has, through the surge, um, has, you know, had, had many different impacts across the country, both nationally as well as regionally, and we continue to monitor these trends, but it definitely has had an impact, and that's what we wanted to show in this data here. Thank you, Mark. One of the things that we know here at Healthy Birthday Inc., the nonprofit that created the Count the Kicks public health campaign, we held um, focus groups with providers, um, with birth workers, um, and with currently um, ex expectant parents um, who are using the Count the Kicks app. We did that um, last summer, and we also did that um, earlier this year to gauge sort of how COVID is changing the prenatal space for them. And it, it does reflect a lot of people being shifted to telehealth or um, maybe having those appointments less frequently, especially um, toward the end of the pregnancy where you might be going every week or every two weeks. Um, we um, learned from them that they were in fact being spaced out which um, you know, we understand why some of those do need to be um, spaced, especially at the beginning when there was um, a lot unknown about the transmission of COVID. Um, but it is a concern because even before COVID, um, the disparities that persist in um, women of color and access to care and you know, many women not being able to see an obstetrician and having that preventive yeah. care until the second trimester or the third trimester and how much preventative care is missed out on, um, you know, could be really damaging to health. And so um, we're, we're glad that, um, you know, where we, we see some, some good news on the horizon that COVID um, with, you know, vaccines um, going out and things like that, that hopefully, um, you know, we're, we're back to seeing doctors um, in person again. And so I'd really like to bring in Buan Foster now, who um, is our New Jersey ambassador, Count the Kicks, and, you know, to talk about those experiences taking place right now in the prenatal space. Buan, you're currently pregnant. We're so thrilled. Um, how have your appointments been moved? Um, have they been moved, you know, to telehealth or been spread out? What, is, what has it been like for you? So I'm considered a high-risk pregnancy as I've been diagnosed with incompetent cervix um, in my prior pregnancies. So starting at 16 weeks, I'm seen every three weeks by my OBGYN and every two weeks by maternal fetal medicine. Telemedicine has not been an option for me because of the fact that I'm high-risk. And at my appointments, only moms are allowed to attend the OBGYN appointments and only one person can attend the scans, which is a lot different than my other pregnancies. Um, there wasn't a cap off for the amount of people that I could bring into the room. And even this is depending on the COVID numbers. There have been points in my pregnancy where visitation has been restricted because of COVID and I've had to attend alone, which is hard. I'm sure that is very hard. Um, so, you know, what is the additional impact of COVID on pregnancy for women right now? According to the CDC, based on what is known at this time, pregnant women are at an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant women. Additionally, pregnant women with COVID-19 might have an increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as preterm birth. But when, what kind of added anxiety or pressure has COVID added to this pregnancy for you? And what are you doing to reduce your anxiety at this time? So first I wanna start off by saying, I tend to look at the positive in all situations, but it's been really hard, as I mentioned, not having all of my family and my support system at appointments, even though I do understand the reason for the restrictions. What helps me reduce stress and anxiety is being prepared. 
Um, I keep a standing list of questions and concerns prior to appointment. So during the time of my appointment, I'm less likely to have a missed opportunity to get a concern addressed. Um, as a public health professional and, a, and an advocate, I also do my own research um, because I consider myself a partner in my care. I also just want to thank you and Wellmark for inviting me to take this time to share my experience. Part of my story has involved unsatisfactory experiences and has caused me to have poor birth outcomes as I've had two second trimester losses prior to this pregnancy. This has given me the skills needed to shed light on these issues as well as partner with providers and organizations to improve maternal child health outcomes. I don't share my story to point the finger or to place the blame. It's really in hopes of partnering to make things better for women and babies to come. I also consider myself, again, to be a vital part in this process. No one knows my body quite like me. So I just wanted to share some tips with you all um, that I've used, and I think they would really be helpful for you in your pregnancy. So trust what you're feeling, and don't be afraid to share that until you're hurt. Have someone that's a designated support person who, in case you're unable to advocate for yourself, they know your wishes. I also want to say that even though I've had two preventable second trimester pregnancies with my current providers, I've decided to stay with them because they know my history unlike a new provider. I challenge them to enter into a partnership with me to see me through a healthy pregnancy. I truly believe this will help other women and babies to come as my providers now have more experience with someone with my condition. My provider was also willing to learn and that counts for a lot to me. So what I wanna just leave you with is do your own research. If you bring something to your provider's attention that they're unwilling to provide, ask that they document that in your chart and they provide you a copy. We really appreciate you sharing um, those tips to help navigate this prenatal space because it can be so tricky um, when you're not seeing your provider as often. And so the idea of taking in questions so you don't forget, um, I think is just really, really smart advice to anyone out there navigating the system right now. And so, you know, let's talk a little bit more about um, COVID and the, the pre prenatal space right now. And let's bring back in Mark Chaluto and Dr. Gutshaw um, to talk a little bit more about COVID. So some of the questions coming up, how can I reduce my risk of getting COVID-19? Um, what about my doctor visits and should I get the, the COVID-19 um, vaccine? And so, um, you know, let's talk first about what are some of the effective ways to reduce your risk of getting COVID other than social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing. Dr. Gutshaw, what are you suggesting? Well, first of all, Emily, uh, I would appreciate it if the fact that your assumption is true, that everybody is already doing the social distancing and hand washing, <laughs> yeah. uh, right, and, and uh, a mask wearing. So that's certainly very important. I, I do uh, believe that. The other thing that I would probably point out to folks to consider is uh, the, contextual, the contextual importance of any uh, interactions you have with people. I mean, that sounds sort of a very broad type of thing. But when we think of the, the because the other thing that the CDC strongly recommends is to avoid crowds. Mm -hmm. So the idea of it, when you go out, what does that crowd really look like? What's the, uh, in essence of it is, it, is it a very dense crowd? In other words, people that will be shoulder to shoulder, or is it something that is going to be more spread out? Is it indoors, It is out, or is it outdoors? All those things contextually are very important as far as understanding what the risk that you may um, start to acquire in regards to getting COVID. And remember, this just isn't you. This is you. This is baby. This is the other people that you interact with, specifically family members. So understanding your own personal risk, I think, is very important. And understanding the contextual um, uh, context of the activity that you're about to engage in is very important as well. So it's just being that uh, sort of discipline and being able to go ahead and to understand what are those factors that you have control of and what are those factors that you don't have control of before you actually get into any activity. We have some questions coming in related to the COVID-19. The first one is, um, you know, how safe are they for pregnant women? What's the latest research that you're seeing on COVID-19 vaccinations? And what's the research showing on that right now? Well, first of all, that obviously is the, um, uh, in essence, the big question in regards to vaccine and, and uh, safety in pregnancy. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to sort of level set the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology what I consider to be the standard bearing organization for the um, uh, health of, uh, uh, of women and specifically pregnant women has said that there should not be any 
of interruption or any avoidance of uh, vaccines to pregnant women who desire them, and specifically to lean on those um, recommendations from the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, uh, which are the ones that define risk. So in essence, the higher risk that you have, the more uh, consistent with that statement, the more likely you should think about whether you should get COVID vaccine. It's also important to know that over 30,000 pregnant women have been vaccinated okay, for COVID. Uh, that's important. Oftentimes we think that all the pregnant women are sitting back and thinking about you know, uh, if they should or should not. And I agree, it's a very, very important decision. But there's an active registry of over 30,000 women who have already had the COVID vaccine and research and, and, and all kinds of eyes are being put on that data right now. Currently, there's no evidence that there's any issues in regards to the COVID vaccine in pregnancy. The, the important thing to understand is the fact that the COVID vaccine cannot cause uh, 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 any impact on the DNA of a woman or, or of a fetus um, uh, intrauterine uh, at this time because of the fact of the way that, that the way the vaccines work. So I think the idea of being able to go ahead and to look at the fact that there is a, there's a lot of women who have been vaccinated who are pregnant, the fact that there's no current literature right now, but also that there's a registry of tens of thousands of women that is actively being investigated and looked at to be able to give more guidance. So in essence, you, you, it's the same thing that we talked about the, in regards to assessing the risk. I, I would suggest that if a woman is very high risk because of a lot of uh, health issues uh, that, they, that could theoretically uh, result in a very poor outcome, both for her and potentially for baby, then consideration of vaccine should be a, a higher priority for that person. Another question that's come in about the vaccine, somebody, um, one of our, our guests on the webinar also wants to know, does the baby receive the benefits of the vaccine if mm -hmm. it gets it? What do you know about that? Yeah, first of all, the, one of the, the, the thing that, that we're trying to understand there is do the antibodies, the things that in essence cause protection for us, do they cross the placenta, okay? And there's, there's a couple different uh, factors because this is so new, again, Think of it, a year ago, this was not even, I mean, you know, a year and three months ago, this was not even a known thing. So the idea is that they are able, in some studies, they, they've been able to show that there are antibodies in, in newborns. The question then becomes, because of the fact that there has been a pandemic going on, were in fact those babies infected relatively early on through just contact with being born and out into the world, or in, or in fact, were they able to be able to have some antibodies cross the placenta and protect the child? Um, I think some of the uh, very, very small studies, right, which obviously you can't hang your hat on totally, but some of, the, some of the studies had shown that there are the kind of antibodies that actually cross the placenta that could theoretically um, uh, uh, help as far as uh, uh, keeping baby healthy, just like, just like with a lot of antibodies. That's true uh, not only with COVID, but for uh, other reasons as well. Maternal antibodies do help protect uh, infants for the first uh, few months of life. And so um, I, I won't say that that's a a given total 100% bought into scientific fact, but there's the potential that that vaccine could have antibodies that crosses the placenta to help baby. There's a lot of interest um, from folks on the webinar today about vaccines, as you might guess. And so we do have another question. Um, what precautions would you recommend that pregnant women take once they are fully vaccinated? Uh, the, the, interestingly, by the way, the CDC just came out recently yeah. with some in regards to people who have been vaccinated. In other words, groups of people who have all been vaccinated, they are starting to lift some of the restrictions in regards to the, um, to the things that we talked about, the masking and the uh, concern in regards to indoor spaces, et cetera. But the big thing is that the, I would continue the very, again, think of mom, think of baby, think of others in your life. I would continue to be very vigilant in regards to my uh, potential exposure both coming at me as well as uh, protecting other folks and, and making sure that we maintain social distance and masking um, uh, uh, and good hand washing exercises uh, and continue with that uh, throughout the pregnancy. I think that that's very important. That solid stuff, my, I have a personal concern uh, in regards to uh, you know, this being sort of a political kind of thing and a lot of uh, folks opening up and, and getting back into no masking, et cetera, too. I think it's premature personally, and I certainly think the CDC agrees with me, so that's always a nice... Uh, uh, spot to a uh, nice partner to to be with uh, on, but I, I would make sure that all those same things, continuing to understand what your environment looks like, continuing to understand the context of uh, of your activity as far as your potential exposure, and even though you you might be doing well, and and if you have gotten vaccinated, you know, uh, uh, good on you. Uh, I would continue to make sure we maintain uh, uh, our concerns about other people around us. 
Lou Ann, I'm curious, in your area, are vaccines um, even available to pregnant women right now? Um, so I believe they are, but I'm not, um, my doctors haven't really given me a recommendation in regards to that. So I've just still been mm -hmm. self-quarantining and staying home. Um, so that's okay. All right, thank you. You know, now that we know a little bit more about COVID, the impact on the prenatal space, Dr. Gutschel, I'm curious, do you think that we still need to be spacing out some of these prenatal appointments or moving to telehealth? Um, if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you know, sort of moving back to those in-person appointments. Yeah, I, first of all, that's a, a, one of the most important things in my mind uh, in regards to the, to the um, whole uh, prenatal visits is the communication. There are some things that can be, so, so my concept here is that virtual visits, when they make sense, some virtual visits won't make sense. If we're having to go ahead and to measure fetal heartbeat or measure size of the uterus, et cetera, sometimes those make, don't make sense. We need to go ahead and to see, uh, you know, in-person visits happen uh, at that point. So I think that the most important thing is communicate, communicate, communicate with your provider. It's important for them and you to understand what are the, how is this going to flesh out? What is the usual rate of visits? And how is that office wanting to go ahead and to change that and then what are the risks and benefits of doing that? I think that that's a very open and important conversation. Um, I am a Vuan fan in regards to what she says about being prepared for those visits. And those are the kinds of questions that you need to, uh, to be able to ask. So uh, I think it's important to understand that do the virtual visits when it makes sense, when you have full understanding of the consequences um, of, of both having or not having um, uh, that in-person visit. I will tell you that my understanding and talking with a lot of my colleagues is a lot of the procedures within the offices are really good now. And so the idea of being able to understand what the office procedures are is, is very important for women to know. Will they need to, you know, are they going to have them wait out in the car before the visit so that they're not, you know, at being congregated within a waiting room? the waiting room chairs and what their spacing is, uh, the mask wearing of everybody that comes into the building. All those things are important to know in order to be able to go ahead and to, again, to evaluate the risk. Oh, Ann, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about that. Um, what is it um, like when you go to your provider's office right now? Sure, so I recently just had a maternal fetal medicine appointment and we have to call in and we have to do the COVID questionnaire via the phone for us and our mm -hmm. one support person for the maternal fetal medicine appointments. And then they tell they call us and let us know if it's okay to come in. So when I was there mm -hmm. last week, um, they had a mom come back into the waiting room because she needed to wait to see a nurse. And there were three of us in the waiting room. So there was somebody about to come in and they had asked them, no, 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 please please wait, we can't have but a certain amount of people in the waiting room. So mm -hmm. there are restrictions in regards to that. We come in one way and we have to exit another way. Um, and these are some of the precautions that have been put in place. They access some time to either wash our hands or our hand sanitize before we sit down. And these are the precautions that my doctor's office have been taking. And how does that feel Very for nice. you? Um, I actually feel really good about it because, again, I feel like they're doing everything to make sure that we're all staying safe. Um, again, I, it was a little disheartening in the beginning to not be able to bring somebody to the OBGYN appointments. Mm -hmm. But again, I understand with the restrict why they have the restrictions. They're really just trying to keep us and baby safe as well as the provider safe. As you might imagine, we're actually getting a lot more questions about um, vaccines and their efficacy and their, their safety. And so I have a couple more questions for you, Dr. Gutschall, if that's okay. Um, one sure. guest is saying that she had COVID in November and recently took an antibodies test and still have them. She asks, would you recommend that she hold off from taking the vaccine until after the baby? She is due in May. Uh, first of all, that, that actually is a, a, a not uncommon kind of representation. And one of the issues associated with that is that is the presence of antibody in a, a person totally consistent with the ability for them to not get infected with COVID, okay? Um, in other words, as the antibodies fall off, and because that's probably what happens, in other words, we don't think that there's lifelong immunity after uh, having a COVID infection, at what point are the antibodies so low that they may not be protective? And that's sort of the unknown. Um, 
So I do think that that would be a great conversation, uh, you know, with her, um, with her provider uh, to discuss that because there, there's, a, there's a bunch of nuance associated with that. So if, if I, certainly that, could that potentially decrease risk of her contracting COVID? Yes, but does antibody level need to be down to zero before someone is at risk of, uh, of having an infection? Uh, that's not true either. So uh, I do think that that, that that is encouraging. That's another part of the factor, but I do think depending on, on this uh, uh, in, person who's inquiring as far as their other risk, uh, there may be a different answer there than, uh, than just waiting. So I would certainly pre refer her back to her provider, but that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and it's one that probably the science can't go ahead and to nail down right now. And again, it just becomes that probability and that, that risk tolerance um, associated with uh, all those circumstances. Speaking of science, um, we have an additional question. Is there an ideal trimester in which the mother should receive the vaccine? Do you know if it's first, second, or third, or does it matter? Uh, I don't think there's any, uh, first of all, there are no studies in regards to that right now. The, the, so the issue then is when are you protected after the vaccine? So you're balancing the idea of if I wait till third trimester, could I have gotten really sick in the first or second trimester? So I, I think the idea that if one says, I, I'm going to get vaccinated when I'm pregnant, there's no literature to suggest that there is the, a, an ideal time because what you're trying to do is prevent the COVID infection caused by SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus, COVID is the disease. Um, what you're trying to do is to prevent that from having a bad outcome for the pregnancy. So I'm not, I certainly don't know that this has actually been looked at yet, again, because this is sort of all new. And I think that register that we talked about with those 30,000 women, those would be some of the questions that they ask in looking at the outcomes of pregnancies in women who have had the vaccine first trimester versus second trimester versus third trimester. I don't think that's actually been looked at, or at least I've not been able to see anything even on a CDC website and in the other stuff that I look at. So uh, stay tuned. Okay. Mark, we do have a question for you as well. Um, related to the data um, in the Health of America report, did you happen to do any comparisons on miscarriages and stillbirths? So for the audience that's here with us today, we'd like to maybe define that. The way this country defines stillbirth is the loss of a baby. Um, it's defined differently in some states, but overall the definition of a stillbirth is the loss of a pregnancy um, at 20 weeks or greater. So the definition of a miscarriage would be earlier, the loss of a pregnancy earlier than 20 weeks. Did you happen to look at that data? I don't mean to put you on the spot. But. No, 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 that's a great question. I've been meaning to uh, write the, the right answer in the chat. I just, I, I didn't want to, <laughs> I was listening to the uh, conversation. I didn't want to lose it, but thank you for asking. So we, um, uh, we are going to look at that. We didn't look at it previously just because there's some issues. Um, when you're dealing with claims issues, and, and Dr. Gutschall, you know this, there are certain things that you can and cannot get. Um, and there's some data limitations to the data related to uh, miscarriages. So um, we have, we're, we're, we're investigating that information uh, deeper. Um, we didn't have enough, um, quite frankly, we, we just didn't have a critical mass of information. So we do believe that there are some data challenges in terms of being able to report that information in claims. Um, and uh, we're further investigating that. So we would like to do, that's one of our to-dos, uh, an additional analysis to do. And to look at those, I know the, 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 the whoever asked the question um, said, are you able to then look at differences across um, zip codes and across areas? The answer to that is yes. Uh, we just have to feel comfortable that we're getting quality data in and in a critical mass of that data. Okay, one additional question for you, Mark. Is hyperactivity the same as ADD slash ADHD? Yeah, it is. There, you know, we group, there's a, we have a sophisticated grouper that groups a, a lot of conditions, but yes, that you know, the short answer to, to that uh, uh, question is yes. Okay, Dr. Gutshaw, one question for you. Does anyone foresee hospitals changing visitor guest policies now that more folks are getting vaccinated, um, it says many clans are, wait, are wanting to bring partners to prenatal visits, like Fuan um, has described. Yeah, you know, as I always say that this is an N of one in my lifetime, certainly as far as a pandemic. And so I think a lot of the things that we've learned in regards to uh, the initiation of the pandemic, again, you know, at least from work from home, et cetera, other kinds of things that happened 
uh, just about this time last year, right? And so the idea of the CDC coming out with the recommendations for those people who have been vaccinated, I think is the first step in looking at that, um, at that transition from uh, the, being very, very, very safe to being able to, being able to open it up again. The concern, however, is that you don't have a lot of the information. Um, uh, you don't have the information in regards to uh, uh, what people may be vaccinated or not vaccinated. And so, and, and then if you are going to go ahead and to try to parse that and to be able to go ahead and to try to identify, well, if you're this person who's been vaccinated, then you get these, in essence, privileges or rights or visitation, whatever. And if you're not, then you're doing that. That's a hard spot, I think, for hospitals to get into and to, in essence, police. So, so the idea, I think, that they want to try to get to probably some general consensus kind of thing. So, again, I think that's going to vary uh, in regards to the states. It's going to re uh, vary in regards to the institutions. So I think the big thing is that if we can really push vaccination and get to that herd immunity, then those answers will be you know, pretty forthcoming, that it's going to be safe for everyone. Whether there's a, a transition period before that, again, uh, institutional risk is different than personal risk of me getting together with a few of uh, our friends that we've all been immunized for, which I think the CDC put out those recommendations. Having institutional risk is a little different type of thing. Um, and when you think about the exposure to people that you don't know, in other words, uh, that person would come in and potentially be in the same space as to, uh, you know, other patients. Um, uh, that gets to be a little bit more of a risk-bearing kind of a uh, question. So I'm assuming it's going to come now. Probably not. I think that the, the risk is to make sure let's keep people safe and let's get down the road a little bit further till we know and possibly even know a little bit more about the variants that are happening right now. Um, and then also the, given the fact that we are going to, in essence, open up a lot of people's personal space with being able to go ahead and interact with, without masks, without social distancing for those people that we know have all been vaccinated, I think that that will help inform that next step. Luann, talk a little bit about the value as the patient, as um, you know, the, the person there coming to, to seek treatment and preventative care. What is, um, in, in delivery, what's the value of having someone with you? Mm. I think it's really important. Um, I've delivered um, two, two babies prior to this, um, which um, they didn't survive. Um, and it was just great having someone other than the provider there with me that knew me and can support me or that could share in those moments. Like my second daughter, she lived for over an hour. So there was about three or four of us in the room. So we all got to hold her. We all got to take mm -hmm. pictures. And I just didn't feel alone. And I think that's the value in having, you know, people other than your providers in the delivery room with you because you just feel supported and you don't feel alone. And I think we all need that even in the midst of a pandemic. It's something that's super important to me. So I'm literally like crossing my fingers and praying that things will change so that I can have at least two people in the room with me when I deliver. I think it's safe to say we are all rooting for, for you and for this baby and very excited for you. Um, mm. Um, you know, you sharing your real experience of what it's been like today has just been really valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Vuillian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we would love to um, thank you all for sending in your questions um, and appreciate the answers from the panelists. And as we sort of um, wrap up our hour together, we'd like to close um, with some key takeaways from our panelists. Um, and about how to improve this pregnancy experience right now. So Dr. Gutshaw, what is one key takeaway for any providers who might be watching? Well, I think you know, for, any, for any of the providers, it actually would be the same for the uh, uh, patients as well as communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, again, when you we think of the pandemic, this is a, uh, again, something that is unique to uh, the many generations that are alive right now and, and hopefully will always be unique and, and a look back. But uh, I think the important for providers is to make sure that, that they know that there is, and, and obviously Mark has um, uh, given a lot of data to undergird this, that, that there's tremendous amounts of anxiety and stress going on with some of the things that we take for granted in regards to how we function and move through life and send our kids to school and, and go to work and other kinds of things. And that's all been disrupted so that there is this uh, this this societal stress and angst that goes on and certainly on add pregnancy on top of that I think the providers really need to make sure that they are able to uh, communicate uh, with their patients to make sure that they're totally up on what the 
protocols are, what they're doing to keep people safe. Uh, the more that they can do that, I think the, the, uh, the better off that the, everyone's going to be. So communication, go figure. Vu- <laughs> Vuan, you're huge on communication. That yes. is uh, key for you as well. Give us, if you don't mind, give the expectant parents on the call today um, some of your, your key takeaways um, for their, the rest of their experience as well. Of course. So I, it's, again, I definitely agree with communication. Communication is key. Um, it's also really a team effort. Um, I just encourage you, expecting moms, to just have a strong co- collaboration with your care team. It's crucial. Absolutely. Feel comfortable doing so. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, um, this would be, I guess, a shameless plug, but on our website, countthekicks.org, we do have tips for t- your provider for speaking up if you have a concern. Um, and so we encourage you to visit countthekicks.org as well to kind of have some of those um, bullet point tips to, to really help um, if it um, at some point is sort of sometimes difficult to, to figure out what to say or how to say it. And so we've provided some key tips that were really developed by um, expectant parents themselves on really what's worked for them um, as well. Vuan, were you going to, I noticed that you're unmuted, so I wanted to make sure, did you want to say something? Sure. So I'm also, can, I can be found on Life After Two Losses. We're on all social media platforms and people reach out to me all the time asking about advocacy and how to be better at advocating for yourself. So I'm definitely a resource if anyone needs help with how to best advocate for yourself. And again, that's Life After Two Losses. And you're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Is that right? And TikTok. We have moved over to TikTok. We had to get yeah. in the new age with all the young folks. So yes, we're on all social media platforms as well as LinkedIn. This is a millennial health pregnancy webinar after all. You would be on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vuan. Thank you. And Mr. Toluto, we'll, um, we'll end with your key takeaway for expectant parents as well. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I started off by just looking at millennial health. And, you know, we did in 2019, we did a whirlwind tour. We went all over the country um, interviewing millennials, employer groups, um, you know, uh, physicians, and really under, underscoring the, the challenges that millennials face in, you know, um, and which contributes to, to their health or, or health outcomes. And we re- I just really want to underscore three of those that we identified, key themes, access. Um, millennials um, are, are looking for, obviously, a trusting, uh, close relationship with their providers um, and uh, a, a face-to-face interaction um, that, uh, with providers, and that's really key. Um, everybody thinks that they want a digital experience, a telehealth experience. That's, that, that's not necessarily the case. They're looking to build uh, relationships based on trust um, and, for, and for the provider community to really know them as individuals, their unique issues, their challenges, um, so that they could provide better care, more appropriate care to them. The second is about holistic care. I did mention the impact of behavioral health conditions on overall health. So we talk about whole care, integrated care, um, it's really, uh, really making sure that you're treating um, not only your physical conditions, but your behavioral health conditions, because those, those have significant impact in terms of uh, 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 um, health outcomes and in terms of a, a healthy pregnancy. So um, don't underestimate that and, 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 and please seek the care that you need. And then the third one is just know your benefits. Um, you know, I wouldn't be saying this on behalf of the Blues. There are a lot of resources, tools, nurses, case managers, counselors that you have access to as part of your benefits and, 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 and make sure for those on the call that they, they do know that and, they, and if you don't um, and if you work for an employer group, really understand what's available to you and the resources that are available to you because I think they could, they could help out significantly in terms of uh, making sure that you get the necessary care and are, and are um, benefiting from all that is being offered. Um, as part of your benefit package. So that's what I would say. Really good advice from all three of you. Thank you so much. Um, So representing Count the Kicks, a stillbirth prevention campaign that has helped dramatically improve birth outcomes. We wanna take this opportunity to tell you how Count the Kicks can help you monitor your baby's well-being in the third trimester, the final weeks of pregnancy. So every day in the third trimester, we do encourage you 
um, to have a daily kick counting session to get to know your baby's normal movement patterns. That's really important. Get to know what's normal for your baby, um, not only the amount of time it takes to get to 10 movements, but the strength of your baby's movements. And if you notice a change, we want you to call your provider. Let them know um, if um, you um, aren't hearing from your provider or it's a weekend, you just go straight to the hospital if you have a concern um, about a change um, in your baby's movements, whether it's strength or the amount of time it takes to get to 10. So as you know, we do have um, a free app. Um, it's in app stores. I think many of you found us today because of um, an invitation um, within our app messaging. And so um, just um, so everyone knows, our free app is available in 12 languages that are all listed there at the top of the screen. It's available for Apple and Android products. You can restart your session or delete a kick if needed. You can set a daily reminder to count the kicks. You can review your kick counting history. It shows that red and pink graph there on the right. So you really do get to know what's normal for your baby. And you'll also be sort of um, waved a red flag if normal starts to change. You can download your history to share with your provider, your family, or your friends. You can text message it, you can email it, you can put it on social media. You can also count with um, single babies or twins. You can also track future pregnancies on the same profile and you can also manage multiple devices registered to your account. We really do wanna thank Walmart um, for making this hour possible for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association for your data and your insights and also from um, the Health of America report and to Vuan for sharing your experience, your key takeaways uh, to help improve the birth experience for other moms. I think that we've um, learned a lot from all of you and your experiences, your data and your insights are greatly appreciated. Um, you can find a special analysis that Walmart has put together just for you on the Millennial Health Report by visiting countthekicks.org slash pregnancy webinars. And we will also email the report, a post event survey and a recording of this webinar to you. Again, this is a series of webinars. This is the first one. And so look for an announcement from us in the coming weeks about what to expect in our next webinar. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you um, for all of the participants who joined us today. Um, we deeply appreciate your help and we wish you really good health. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.